Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn. I'm your host, Deb Philman. At The Reason We Learn, we aspire to be part of the solution. The purpose of this show is to take a good, honest, potentially painful look at the way kids are being educated. We know we can do better, and this is where we'll talk about how. Let's learn something. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Reason We Learn and Dissident Dispatch. I'm your host, Deb Philman. It is Monday, the what 18th of December, 2023, and our last Dissident Dispatch before Christmas, before the holiday. I will not be doing a show on Christmas Day because y'all probably won't come, but I will be live streaming the uh, the burning of my University of Pennsylvania diploma as promised. So I'll let you know when that's going to happen and um, whether I'm going to do it here or how, where, what venue, but it will be live streamed. I am going to burn it. Um, don't worry. Digital lasts forever. I'll take pictures of it. So if I need to apply for jobs, I'll have a picture. But the physical representation of it, I do not need to have in my possession. It will be very cathartic to burn it. And I plan to tag the Graduate School of Education and let them know exactly how much their garbage means to me. Like I said, I don't envision applying for jobs that require it anytime soon, if at all. But if I do, uh, they have to give me another one or I can show them a picture. Um, all right. So if you're new to the channel, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're watching on the replay, also welcome. Um, please go ahead and like and share the broadcast, especially if you're watching us live so that you can, uh, you know, share this with other people who want to hear it live, might have questions for me, and uh, we can have this be interactive. I will do my best to field your questions as I can, um, but I don't have a mod helping me, so I just kind of sometimes look over and grab things. Um, I'll do my level best. Sometimes I take pauses and I go through, but just letting you know, if I don't get to your question immediately, um, that's why. <laughs> uh, super chats, of course, I'm going to see, so you know, there's always that. Uh, speaking of which, if you are not yet a member of my Woke Screen community, please consider joining. Today is day five of our 12 Days of Christmas special, and we are offering at wokescreen.com forward slash the reason we learn the free upgrade to my highest membership, the rhetorician. So I have Logish, a grammarian, which is basically free. You just kind of get in and see a one-stop shop for all my content. Logician, where you get to interact with me and see some members only content, like subscriber only content uh, twice a week, plus links and resources. And then a rhetorician is like, you get private chat with me, you get di bigger discounts on merchandise, all kinds of cool stuff. And if you join today, you can upgrade to that highest level with a code. So you join first as logician, then you grab the code, you upgrade using the code. Don't forget to use the code and you'll have that level of membership. Uh, at no additional cost. So consider it. Then the cool thing is you could use your affiliate code with your rhetorician membership and go out and recruit more members to come in and you'll get paid with your affiliate code. So all kinds of good things in store. Come the new year, we're going to be having um, another separate uh, support group. I'm going to be launching that pretty soon. So you get to see a preview of what that will be about. Lots of good things in store. But I know you're here for this show. So let's get started. Today, we're going to be talking primarily about a new thing that has dropped from the CDC, uh, and I have the document. I'm going to show it to you, but this isn't, we're going to talk about some things before I dive into it, because um, I want to give you some background and, and set the stage here. This is the new thing that dropped, thanks to Alexis, who uh, shared it with me. She's been on this channel before, if you're not familiar with her. Um, I will put her contact information down below, but she keeps watch over all kinds of cool things. She's from Haverford, Pennsylvania, and she brought this to my attention, promoting mental health and well-being in schools and action guide for school and district leaders, CDC. But as I said, before we dive into looking at that, I want to briefly review some of the news about what we've done so far in schools for mental health and how's it working out? How's it going? Well, not so good. Not so good. Uh, you may have seen this article. This is from, uh, it says today, but this wasn't actually published today. This was published December 11th. In of all places, the Boston Herald, shockingly. And it's an editorial. So it's not just like one person wrote it. This is an editorial. It says, new education fad leaves kids depressed. New education fad 
leaves kids depressed. What fad might that be, I wonder? There are many reasons to be depressed about public education in America. Oh, where shall we start? But the craze that has swept through public schools is actually increasing depression among students. You may have heard about social and emotional learning. Any of y'all heard of it? You guys ever heard of it? Heard of social emotional learning? <laughs> maybe on this channel, maybe somewhere else. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the major trend in public education and has gained steam over the past decade. Its intention, well, that's debatable. Its intention is to help students acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities, manage emotions, and achieve personal and collective goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain supportive relationships, and make responsible, caring decisions. That's in quotes because it's taken directly from Castle, according to the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. So there you have it. They just repeated, this is its intention. That's what they say they want to do. That's a murky scramble of buzzwords and catchphrases. This is an editorial. I'm sorry, I'm a little giddy about how accurate the description is. That's a murky scramble of buzzwords and catchphrases that only an academic could love. Such pseudo sophisticates are well represented among the education establishment. In intelligible terms, SEL aims to make students better people, which in theory, will improve academic outcomes. In theory. I don't know. I've known a lot of assholes who are straight-A students, a lot of really sweet, wonderful, caring, nice, kind, even well-adjusted people who just can't get it together to get more than a C. So I'm not sure about that. These goals are certainly noble and well-intentioned, but would it be impolite to point out that perhaps America's public schools shouldn't be piling more trendy instruction on the plate when many are already failing to adequately get students up to speed in reading, writing, and arithmetic. I've asked that question myself many times, as I know many of you have. One obvious problem is that many of the terms in SEL are subjective. Thank you for joining the chat. We've been saying this for years, right? There is an objectively correct answer to 47 plus 58. Helping students to develop healthy identities is subjective. That's why areas such as this have traditionally been the primary responsibility of parents. Unsurprisingly, the research shows SEL is disastrous for students. That's, that's pretty bold. Unsurprisingly, the research shows SEL is disastrous for students. As psychologist and USC professor Darby Sachs wrote, Saxby wrote in the New York Times recently, the journal Behavior Research and Therapy published a study of more than 1,000 students in Australia. One set of students participated in traditional health class. The other was an SEL program called Wise Teens. In the standard class, one in 13 students appeared clinically depressed. In the Wise group, it was one in eight. A study of 8,000 British teenagers had similar findings. So you have Australia and Britain. They're kind of far apart. Not the same, right? I mean, you know, some similar cultural things, but it's not like it was, you know, one town and another town. Similar findings. By focusing teenagers' attention on mental health issues, these interventions may have unwittingly exacerbated their problems, Saxby wrote. It's counterproductive to tell a teenager that normal anxiety is actually a symptom of mental illness. Another possible explanation he suggested is that school is a poor place to teach contemplative skills like mindfulness. You think? Outside of government, those who fail at the, the primary task are given fewer responsibilities, not more. Schools should return their focus to helping students read and do math, not chasing the trendiest education fad. Now, what is all this underneath, right? We, we're talking about depression. We're talking about kids taking SEL class in lieu of health, and they're turning up more depressed, not less. More depressed not less. And now the CDC has something new. So let's take a look at that. This was the universal DBT in schools increases anxiety, depression, and family conflict. In recent years, teaching kids emotional regulation has become an increasingly large part of teachers' responsibility. So again, now we're still in schools talking about schools taking on the role of doing something about a teen or a child's mental health and well-being. And it's not working. 
like so far it's not working and we know there are other problems that are not only not getting better, like, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, but they're getting worse. And this says there is evidence that existing SEL programs lead to slightly better outcomes, including both academically and in terms of mental health. However, publication bias, low quality studies, the fact that each intervention for SEL is quite different from the others and the small size of the effect makes the results of these studies difficult to interpret. And let's say they're neutral. We're still spending billions of dollars on them. So even if they weren't harmful, they certainly aren't effective to a level that warrants us spending as much money as we've been spending, never mind more. That's why it's essential to test specific types of SEL interventions rigorously, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that goes into more detail about how it's it increases problem, it increased problems. SEL, which is the primary mode of, you know, doing anything about mental health. And then I ran across this wonderful thread with Abigail Schreier. America threw more preventive mental health resources at Gen Z than any generation prior. That's what all that SEL stuff was for, ostensibly. Therapeutic techniques guided how these kids were parented. So not just in the schools. America as a whole has been mental healthing our kids on social media, on TV, everywhere they look, they're hearing terms about anxiety and depression and mindfulness and meditation and all as if the number one thing they need to be worried about is their mental health at all times. Like they're in constant danger of mental illness, all of them. There's trauma everywhere. Um, Therapeutic, they guided how these kids were parented. Our kids were treated to social emotional learning and empathy education and restorative justice, which is grounded in the whole, what's the psychological problem underpinning their bad behavior, root cause theory at school. Schools hired large psych and counseling staffs to support them. Kids had more access to therapists and psychiatric meds than any prior generation. And these interventions were destigmatized. So they weren't just offered and given there was like, this is so good. Do you want to talk? Let's have a circle. Let's, let's share, let's journal. Let's talk about our mental health. It's part of your identity at this point to have anxiety. It became trendy in and of itself to have a diagnosis, not just it's okay to see a therapist. Don't pick on anyone, but what's your diagnosis? We're seeing it pop up in people's bios. Yeah, I have generalized anxiety disorder. I have bipolar disorder. I have this disorder. I'm depressed. I'm on these three meds. It, it got normalized to the point of being almost desirable. Certainly because there's currency in having that as a root cause excuse if you misbehave or don't do well on a test, right? If we're going to say, oh, all these things are evidence of mental health problems, kids are pretty savvy. Oh, yeah, I have a mental health problem. That's why. That's my excuse. Those are my problems. And I don't mean to, to um, cast aspersions on people with legitimate mental health problems at any age, but how do we know anymore? How are we going to decide? We've, we've destigmatized it to the point of normalizing it. Um, <clears throat> did this unprecedented investment succeed? Did we produce a happy, healthy, strong generation eager and ready to take on the challenges of adulthood? quite the opposite. The entire project didn't simply fail. It backfired spectacularly. Our mental health interventions were counterproductive. They made our kids sicker, sadder, and more afraid to grow up. I needed to know why. And as a parent of Gen Z kids, I needed to know what we could do to fix it. Pre-order bad therapy. So she wrote a book and it's, you can pre-order it now on Amazon. It's called bad therapy. Why the kids aren't growing up. And if any of you out in the audience have teenagers, adolescents, perhaps you can attest to this, even those who don't have a diagnosis per se, seem to be a little less eager to drive, a little less eager to leave the house and just you know go hang out with their friends, a little less eager to do a lot of things than they used to be, have relationships, date, speak on the phone, just call someone everything's happening electronically. They don't tend to make eye contact as readily. Um, there's a lot of nervousness around basic things like ordering food at a restaurant. That's a real thing. 
menu anxiety is now on the menu of disorders. Just saw it the other day. They don't want to order in a restaurant. We're talking about 15, 16, 17 year olds. Mom, can you order for me? Or so just can you just order for me? Pretty soon we're going to have adolescents at Golden Corral because it's a buffet. I don't know. But these are real. Oh, yes, it's real. Let me see if I can actually find the uh, the article about um, menu anxiety because, uh, you know, I, I'd, I wouldn't have believed it myself if I hadn't um, seen it. But then, you know, having seen it, uh, it was there. So the, the point is that um, uh, kids are demonstrably less doing less well than they, uh, they have been in the past. Um, and yet we've poured more and more effort into all of the things, just all of the, um, all of the interventions we possibly could hiring counselors, social workers, you name it. Um, then I found this from Jonathan Haidt. If you are not familiar with Jonathan Haidt, um, he and Greg Lukianoff wrote a book some years ago. I think it goes back to 20, I want to say 2013, 2014, something along those lines, um, Coddling of the American Mind, and which I highly recommend, by the way. And in Coddling, they talk about how, this is like almost 10 years ago at this point, how schools primarily through these SEL programs and the message that both explicit and implicit message these programs send to kids, we're teaching them cognitive distortion, which is highly correlated with depression and anxiety. Most people who are depressed have some measure of cognitive distortion. Most people who are highly anxious have some measure of cognitive distortion. In fact, they're so closely linked that the type of therapy that works best for it cognitive behavioral therapy works because it challenges the distortions. It challenges the thought patterns. It doesn't reinforce them and it certainly doesn't project them. And those thought patterns are things like catastrophizing, seeing the word, you know, mind reading, imagining that you know what someone else is thinking about you when you couldn't possibly, and then assuming it's the worst possible thought they could ever have. Um, a, a thought that bad things that happen to you happen to you specifically, not just randomly bad stuff happens to people and that that's going to be pervasive and persistent. This is, these are the hallmarks of cognitive distortions. Also, you, you know, people who have cognitive distortion think that which does not kill me makes me weaker. Like I have to be protected from bad things and bad thoughts. Does that sound familiar? Microaggressions, trauma, safety, safe spaces, right? So in their book, they identified that, you know, these trends towards teaching kids the exact opposite, not only of what we were taught when we were kids, but just of what we know challenges the kinds of distortions that contribute to depression and low-grade mental illness. We're not talking now about bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and things that have a chemical, you know, uh, origin. We're talking about the kind of cognitive disturbances that we are seeing rampant right now, that we're calling mental illness that previously we would have said that person has cognitive distortion or that person needs to get their thoughts straight. They're not thinking correctly. They, you know, and when we go into schools and we teach them about things like Everyone who is like this is racist and that, you know, people are against you. There's oppressors and oppressed that, you know, if something bad happened or a bad outcome, it was because of racism. It was going to very bad people who are trying to keep you down. Do you think that plus the kind of SEL that says you have obligations to other people, even people you don't know far, far away because social justice and you need to be very, very aware and feel empathy for those people. And you need to sort of, subjugate your own needs, at least insofar as they might conflict with someone else's needs, especially if that uh, someone else is, you know, has more boxes ticked on the intersectional scale than you. 
So it's also no wonder that we see the highest rates of increase in depression in girls who are, shall we say, pigmentally challenged. And boys as well. It just manifests a little differently. But this is what we're seeing. Rates of suicide, rates of depression skyrocket. And here's what he says. Here's the 14th explanation for the teen mental health crisis, which does not work. Parents are increasingly abusive since 2010. Yes, they're saying that. Mm -hmm. They're not, he says, which of course we're not. Nobody has yet proposed an explanation for the crisis that works, especially internationally, other than the rapid teen transition from flip phones to smartphones around 2012. This also explains why academic achievement stopped rising around 2012 and started declining as shown in both NAEP and PISA scores. Students with smartphones pay less attention to teachers and fellow students. And then there, I'll show you the little 13 failed explanations. Here is her rebuttal of the 14th explanation. And there's a, a rebuttal here. I'll put all these links in the description box after the, the video is done. But basically, it says, note that teen satisfaction with life used to track satisfaction with relationship with parents until they moved on to smartphones. Can we at least get phones out of the school day? Look at what happened here plummet used to be right along, you know, satisfied with parents, satisfied with life as a whole. Now they're just dissatisfied with everything. Okay. So I mean, dissatisfied with life as a whole, but they're still satisfied with parents. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed, but they're dissatisfied with life. Now he mentioned smartphones. What do smartphones do? They show you everything that's going on in other people's minds that you previously never could see, not just in your peer group, but also out there in the adult world. And it's, it's intense. It's a lot of information really fast. Now take that perspective into the school where they've got SEL and they're teaching you that, you know, Oh, this will hurt you. This is trauma. This is microaggression. This is because of racism. This outcome is that, uh, you know, People, you shouldn't try to lose weight. That's fat shaming. You shouldn't do this. That's hurting this person, that person, the other person. You are harmed if so-and-so says X to you. That is an existential threat. You're These people who don't like what you're doing don't want you to exist anymore. So this is the kind of thing. These are the messages that they're getting that are, you know, they get stimuli from the internet, some of which is instigated by the teachers. Go check out this website. And then they come back into school and everything is reinforced. Their worst fear, their worst, you know, conclusion and explanation about how they feel inside looking at all this stuff on TikTok or wherever is validated. That way you feel gets yeah, totally valid. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's reasons. And then you have that. Uh, there's a little chart. So this, there's Alexis, there's, there she is posting this. Um, and then somebody says here, I can tell you exactly why it's happening. Mental illness has become trendy. Being gay or trans or non-binary has become trendy. Kids are faking being mentally ill and faking being LGBTQ. Sadly, these things are driving some of them actually crazy. We, we don't know how many are faking, how many are telling the truth. We don't even know if they know. That's the sad part. We don't know. But we do know is the numbers have risen to a level that could not possibly have been caused organically. There's there's no, you could round up the top five causes, including SEL, and you still wouldn't get the 4,000% increase that we're seeing in some conditions that just because that just wouldn't happen. Um, and then somebody put together this, this is the frequency. It says, notice how well that tracks with the ascendancy of the new secular cult. The one that centrists love to over let overrun every institution, almost as if constant guilt trips, anxiety, doomsdayism, and constant racial conflict are bad for the psyche. Demographics ensures it stay relevant. So here they are. You probably can't see them all that well. Let me see if I can make it any bigger. Yeah, here we go. Look at the graphs. These are word usage frequency. So it means word usage in media. Remember we talked about the students on the, the phones from 2012 onward. Now look at this. This just goes up to 2018. That sharp increase, I would say, is probably 2012. Right in line with the smartphones and the social media and everything else, which is now then getting validated in the school. 
look at this, sexism, misogyny, sexist, patriarchy, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it just goes on and on. They were seeing these words, they're reading these words, they're hearing these words constantly. Might that have some effect? So to be clear, yes, we have a problem. I'm not denying there's a problem. It's like when people talk about climate change, are you denying it? I was like, no, not denying it. I'm questioning some of the proposed solutions. And it's the same here. I am not denying that we have an epidemic of mental illness. I think, first of all, it's being misdiagnosed as to what it is, which mental illness it is. I think we have an epidemic of cluster B personality disorders that are may or may not at this point be treatable. And by that, I mean a kind of exaggerated narcissism, narcissism, a kind of, you know, some borderline personality disorder where people are just so addicted to attention and they are so fearful of rejection that they do all kinds of strange things. Um, I think we have an epidemic of a kind of anxiety that is uh, like is caused by external factors that could be addressed with CBT not DBT in the classroom, but one-on-one -on -one CBT with somebody responsible says, does that track? Does that really make sense? Are you sure? Do you have evidence for that? But we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to say, do you have evidence for that? Your feelings are valid. Your lived experience is truth, your truth, my truth. So it's very hard for somebody who wants to practice CBT to say, mm, are you sure though? Really? Could you possibly be imagining it? I mean, I... I know therapists that would want to ask those questions, but they might be shunned by their fellow therapists at this point. So what happened is back in, let's see, this is now uh, April, May of this year, new legislation passed because it's always about money, isn't it? We have a crisis. There's so much mental health that we have all these problems. Even though, like I said, coddling was published way before this. And they identified all the things we're teaching kids that are, you know, not working. Let's just blow right by that. Let's ignore the best-selling book. Let's ignore all the research that backs up what they said in the book. Let's ignore, you know, how much worse it's gotten as we've ramped up doing more of the things that they said in the book don't do. And we're going to ignore that. And plow straight ahead as if what we're teaching in school or the fact that we're doing any of this in school might be contributing to it. And you know what? Let's get more money. Let's get more money to do more. Let's, let's do more of it. New legislation will boost school mental health services. There has been too little funding, according to whom? Who decided that? On the basis of what? How did they know? Et cetera. And too few providers. Really? Really? Were there too few providers? Or did you need to create some more jobs for your friends to fill the need for public school mental health? Did you know that that was a legit form of you know, government service in the schools? Did you ever feel when you were growing up there were just too few school counselors to handle everything that was going on? Did you, as a parent or even a taxpayer, consider it the proper role of government and government school to tend to diagnose and treat mental illness inside of the school? Or did you kind of hope parents would take care of that outside the school with some other way of dealing with it. Even if school kind of helped and said, oh, whoa, something's up. Hey, mom and dad, can you uh, come get your kid? Get a problem, go take him to see a counselor. All right. So a federal law passed in June, 2022 promises some relief. Relief for whom? The people who claim there's too little funding and too few providers. Because we can't tie the money directly to any solution, can we? 55% of U.S. schools provide students with mental health assessments, with only 42% of public schools providing mental health treatment only. They consider this a bad thing. They want these numbers to be 100%. So I want you to look at this. I want you to really digest this. This article, which is from the American Psychological Association, is saying it is a bad thing that only a little more than half of public schools provide students with assessments. And only 42% provide the treatment right there at the school. It's terrible. Of course, they have no self-interest at all. 54% um, said low funding is the main reason for the lack of services. Low funding. Not we're busy doing other things. 
If you give us money, we'll do it. We'll do anything if you give us enough money. It's the school after all in loco parentis. We'll do, you know, what, what, what would you like us to do? Should we perform surgery too? Only X percentage of schools are like shoving vaccines into people's arms at school. If only we had more money, we could do it for all the kids. I mean, this is kind of where we're at. $1 billion. That is the amount the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Hold the phone. So it's a Safer Communities Act that provided a billion dollars for in-school mental health support over five years. So this is 2023. That means 2028, we got a billion dollars between now and then. And these schools are going to be going, gimme, 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 gimme. How am I going to spend this money? So it's not going to really be optional at this point, like whether your district, if you're in a public school district, is going to be grabbing for this money. I promise you they want it and they're going to go take it because who turns down money? And that means they're going to hire the people to implement this stuff or they're going to hire, pay for a contract with a private provider to deliver it inside the school. This will happen. And then I thought to myself, like, well, where did they get the idea that this was super necessary? Like, what is like? Well, fact sheet, Biden-Harris administration announces new actions to tackle nation's mental health crisis. Now, there's in the whole nation, not just schools. We're all sick in the head, according to the Biden-Harris administration. This mental health awareness month, so this is going back to May. So that was April, May. This is May. We honor, we honor the, all those experiencing mental health challenges and celebrate the mental health professionals, families, and caregivers who support them. Why are we honoring people with mental health conditions? And why is the federal government doing this at all? When did it become the role of the president of the United States and the federal government to honor people with a specific condition? I'm, I'm missing. Is it an accomplishment now to be mentally ill? Does that make you special? Because that we honor people who are special. I'm just saying. I think it's kind of weird. But maybe that's just me. I mean, have I, have we gotten to a point where we no longer pause when we hear something or read something to say, wait, wait, wait. That's weird. Honor? Celebrate? What? Why do people need so much approbation? Mental health professionals, that's a job they chose. Don't put a gun to their head and say, go be a mental health professional. They chose it. We need to celebrate them. Does everybody need to be celebrated all the time for their job? Oh, good for you. You're a garbage collector. We celebrate you. Um, It's clear that our country is facing, an, uh, everything's unprecedented If once you don't teach history. Um, mental health crisis impacting, impacting people of all ages. In 2021, two in five American adults reported, we're going to look at that, reported experiencing symptoms of anxiety and depression, and 44% of high school students reported struggling with persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic response, response, social media, well, we talked about that, and gun violence, really had to throw in gun violence. Gun violence is not nearly the problem. It's kind of like saying, I'm really anxious about quicksand because I watch too much Gilligan's Island. Uh, the Biden-Harris administration is firmly committed to addressing this crisis. Firmly committed. Is there, so there's what, like limply committed? <laughs> I thought committed was committed and not committed is not committed, but firmly committed. They're firmly committed. Okay. Uh, so we're now let's take a look. I'm not gonna read through all of this junk. But I want you to see where they got the impression that people that you know people were were reporting all this. Well, they did a survey. It's called the Anxiety and Depression Household Pulse Survey. To rapidly monitor recent changes in mental health. Again, did you know that was a function of your federal government? And I'm just curious if this was a legitimate function of the federal government, why didn't they think about? you know, in advance when they made their decision to lock everybody down and 
force people to get vaccines and force people to do all kinds of stuff. Did, didn't it cross their mind there might be some mental health implications of isolating people, not letting them go to church, not letting them go to weddings, funerals of loved ones, be by their loved one's side when they're in the hospital or in the nursing home? Did they think that, you know, maybe this would have some fallout in the future that they would then be responsible to deal with? I mean, if they consider themselves responsible for our mental health, did it not cross their minds that they were undertaking to ruin it when they chose those solutions? Because it seems to me they didn't. Because every time we were like, excuse me, I don't think it's a good idea to isolate people, especially like the old and the young, just don't have the same coping you know, ability because of you know their age and their conditions and things like that. Shut up. You're not a patriot. What are you, a denier? <laughs> you just want people to get sick. You just want to kill grandma. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, you would have thought that merely asking the question about what it might do to a child, for example, that you're, we're just like the worst person ever to ask a question about that. But now it's like, oh, we have to solve this problem. With your money, of course, that you have less of now because we, you know, locked you up. Anyway, <laughs> didn't allow you to charge rent if you were a landlord, didn't allow you to go to work if you worked and you weren't essential. Anyhow, uh, sorry, I keep, this kind of stuff bothers me so much. I keep going off on these tangents because everything is connected and it pisses me off that they can have the gall to put something like this out and average Americans just, first of all, don't know it exists, don't read it. But those who do are like, this is wonderful. I'm so happy that my government cares so much about me. <laughs> and they don't ever stop and think like, they did this to you, you moron. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this bothers me. All right. <clears throat> so they ask questions to obtain information on the frequency of anxiety and depression symptoms. The questionnaire, or modified version of the two-part patient health questionnaire, the two-item generalized anxiety disorder scale. Question number one from Deb. How much can we rely on self-reported information on a census questionnaire about how people are feeling here? And the reason I ask that cynically is that I got my census notice down at Sarah's. I've gotten like three, and this is me. I'm not. I'm not even filling it out. And they say the penalty. Oh, come and get me! But the people who first of all send it in. Second of all, send it in with, oh, would you like to know how I'm feeling and name my innermost thoughts? I'm already a kind of a person I don't understand. I'm sorry that you're talking to your government. Why are you telling them about your symptoms of anxiety disorder? It's the government. And we're going to talk about why that might be a problem to share with them that you're having feels. Uh, anyhow, so they reported all this information the sample that they had and thus concluded from the sample without knowing anything about the people themselves, like what kind of person does do this? Maybe that's also an indicator of something going on. Um, they, that, that, they left that out. They're just, a, you know, absolutely representative of Americans. So that's why I'm so cynical about that. So that's where they got the idea that they needed to come up with this, which is the Promoting Mental Health and Wellbeing in Schools Action Guide. And this is the website version of it. Like this is where they talk about it, you know, at a glance. And I'm showing you this because I want you to see who the audience is and the goal. School and district leaders of kindergarten through 12th grade schools, including principals and leaders of student support teams. Goal, provides school and district leaders with strategies, approaches, and practices that can improve students' mental health. Well, if they could, they would have. And I just showed you, they have not. And people have recognized they have not. People have recognized they have not for all, a, a decade. And yet, and yet, they talk about, you know, the strategy and then the approach. Deliver classroom-based mental health education curricula aka SEL. Use peer-led modeling programs. Really, I want my peers modeling mental health for me when you've just told me half of them are mentally ill. Deliver classroom-based mindfulness education. We already talked about how that doesn't work so very well. Build, provide classroom instruction focused on building social skills and emotional. This just dropped, you guys. 
And yet we have all this, it's iatrogenic. It actually causes the problem. Hey, here's a billion dollars. Go do more. Go do more. So now we're going to look at the document itself. Here it is. Let's take a look at the table of contents. Things to keep in mind when implementing strategies to promote mental health and well-being in school. Multi-tiered systems of support. You guys ever heard of that? MTSS? Yeah. They're starting all the students in all the schools at tier one. At tier one. That means they're all getting assessed. Baseline assessment for mental health problems. We parents, we taxpayers do not know because we rarely get to see them, what the criteria are for establishing that a student needs supports. We've seen what they've done to grades as far as grade inflation. We've seen what they call gender dysphoria. Oh, she likes playing with trucks. She must really be a boy. Oh, he likes to play with dolls. Maybe he's a girl trapped in a boy's body. I mean, we know how low level they are with their diagnoses of that. So can you imagine what the diagnostic criteria are going to be for finding out if your kid has, is suffering from anxiety disorder, depression, you know, even things that might require a drug? What if your kid's just really independent, doesn't want to go along with any of this crap? Oh, antisocial personality disorder. They might need some antipsychotics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Using comprehensive assessment tools in the school. These are not doctors. These are school counselors, school psychologists. And you should know that when they're operating inside of the school, their code of ethics is different. If you took your children to a psychologist outside the school, their code of ethics would dictate that you would need to be involved in the process. If they're under the age of 12, at least in most states, you would be you would have to make all the care decisions for them and everything. And you'd have to give, you'd, you'd be informed and you'd have to give consent. Inside the school, they don't even have to tell you your kid's being assessed. They don't have to tell you your kid's been diagnosed. They don't have to tell you they've decided to take the next step at a higher level or higher tier of support and possibly even making sure they're getting medication, depending on the state. But if your child is over older 12, over 12, your child can consent in most states in this country to be treated and medicated without you ever knowing about it. Role of all school staff in supporting student well-being and mental health. Now you, the teacher, have a role to play. You're not trained in any of this. You're not trained in identifying what is and is not a mental health problem, but you have a role to play too. So if you're a good teacher, you're pissed off because now you've got extra responsibility. And if you're a bad teacher, like, yay, more power. <clears throat> Diverse needs of students, blah, 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 blah. Strategies for promoting mental health in school increase students' mental health literacy. This is just a fancy way of saying make sure all the kids have all the, you know, psych to go terms memorized they could already get on TikTok and, and YouTube. Make sure they all know. So if you were shielding your kid from this garbage and they didn't have access to all of it on a smartphone and you didn't let them watch endless hours of YouTube or have, have TikTok, don't worry. It's okay. They'll learn all about the different diagnoses from the school so they can self-diagnose. Um, deliver classroom-based mental health education curricula. Uh, I should note that they'll be coming home and diagnosing you too. Yeah. Yeah, that's going to happen. It's already happening. Kids are coming home. Young kids, 11, 12-year-old kids are coming home and diagnosing their parents. Telling their parents they're toxic. Telling their parents that some behavior or other is abusive. Yeah, super fun. Um, focus on equity. Focus on equity. Mindfulness, they're going to deliver. Everything is delivered at the classroom, delivered in the classroom. Social and emotional behavioral learning. Notice they add the word behavioral. It used to be social emotional learning. They snuck behavioral in there. Behavioral is that Pavlovian dog Skinner stuff where it's like, here's the stimulus. This is the behavior we want to see afterwards. Oh, we didn't get the behavior. We're going to have a negative consequence. Go back and do it again. They want the students to behave in very specific ways. So they're going to be using behaviorist methods 
stimulus response, stimulus response. It's like dog training. Yeah, they snuck that in there. So if you think this is like, oh, behavior learning, they're going to teach them how to behave properly, goals and rule type stuff, right? No, no. Uh, let's see, moving on. We've got, you know, connecting students. They're going to psychologize you, students, staff, and families. Yeah. Like I said, the kid's going to go, is that why my mom yells? Oh, does your mom have antisocial personality disorder? Let's find out. Your child reports that you've been yelling a lot at home. And so we think you should come in for an assessment. If you don't, well, you know, it's going to be noted in their file that you're not willing to partner with us to help your child be more successful. Then you become the problem if you push back on any of this. Psychosocial skills training, cognitive behavioral interventions, promote acceptance and commitment to change. This is what the school can do. So, you know, provide cognitive behavioral interventions. Oh, I wish. Wonder what those look like. Engage students in coping skills training groups. <laughs> Have you ever talked to kids about how much they despise doing group work at school? I don't know a single kid who likes it, except the kids who are power hungry. I don't know any normal, well-adjusted child that likes doing anything other than maybe playing kickball in a group. Um, and this goes on more focus on equity, support staff well-being, focus on equity. And then they go into how they pick the peer-reviewed literature, et cetera. Uh, I did want to look at this, show you this. I had somebody take a look at this before the show for me. And the comments like I said, is this legit? It, was, this, was this a good way of doing the research? And the, the comments I got back is from a scientist. Um, it's not utterly terrible and that they do demand only including studies that are based on randomized controlled trials or that have comparison groups. They also make sure to include pre and post test groups. What strikes me strange is why they would exclude anything published before 2011 or anything with data gathered pre 2011. Usually for a literature review like this, you would not do that. Now, one theory I have is remember we looked at those charts, all those charts of the big lines that went up in 2012 when the smartphones came out. If you looked at data prior to 2011, it might skew everything because you won't, won't have that variable. And you might see, you know, higher degrees of health in the, in the absence of any of this stuff, the social, emotional learning, all this. And it would look a little weird that you had a lot less in terms of mental health problems. And yet there was also not all of this intervention. They've had the interventions now at least since 2012, at least as Jonathan Haidt was talking about, there, we had this, this weird stuff coming up that they were got to write a book about. So it might really skew things and they'd have to own the fact that they've been doing interventions for the, you know, from before, from 2011 on, and things are markedly worse than before 2011. Again, I'm not a scientist. Maybe that's not the reason, but it's one theory that I have. Uh, usually for a literature review like this, you would not do that. Like I said, leave those out. For some, for something for school leaders, why would they also exclude after school activities or other related outcomes? Look at the excludes column for the outcome section. How many of those things are related to mental health of a child? I would say lots of them, all of them. The focus group thing is sketchy. They provide nothing about how participants were selected for that. The expert listening session is also sketchy. If the experts are biased, biased collectively in favor of SEL. So I wanted to look at that. And I wanted somebody who's more, you know, up on how to do research to tell us about that because it just gave me a feeling. I looked at it, I was like, these things in the exclude column seem strange to me. And now I, you know, I know that they kind of are strange. So, uh, you know, we could go through this, you know, page by page and so on. But the gist of this show is really that this exists that it exists in such detail with so much stuff. And I mean, let's just take one focus on equity. How about that? We'll do that. Consider ways to expand the availability of mental health services through partnerships with local, state, and regional organizations, as well as community-based groups. Now, most community-based groups like that have some kind of political agenda, don't they? Um, for example, in schools, a large population of Spanish speaking students, school, schools can identify, this makes sense if you need, you know, other, other language, but that is presupposing they all need this in the first place. Let's go get people to speak their language to do the thing that we probably shouldn't be doing anyway. So there's some equity. Um, 
use CDC's health education analysis tool to examine health education curricula, compare strengths and weaknesses of multiple curricula. This is getting so detailed and would require the school admins and teachers to do a lot of work. Now ask yourself this, do they have, do they have the wherewithal intellectually, staff, et cetera, to do this level of analysis? Or do you think it's more likely that a third party provider is going to come in with a glossy presentation and maybe even a nice lunch for them and say, we can do this all for you. Here's our, you know, marketing pitch. Let us do it. Cause that's what's happening. We'll hire the professionals. They'll be school officials, but they work for us. We'll collect the data, which we will also own, and you'll have the data. We'll do we'll do it. We'll implement it. We know how to pick the right curricula. Da, 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 da. So then you have these public-private partnerships, and a lot of these private corporations are making bank, some of which are, you know, in my opinion, uh conflicted in terms of being related to people in government or having connections to people in government who pass these kinds of bills and so on. So there are, you really should look in your district as to like, where's the money going that we took in for mental health, who's getting it and who are they related to? And you might be surprised to find there's a member of your school board. Who's the, you know, wife, son-in-law, husband, da, 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 of one of these companies or, you know, the, your local assembly person, Congress person, blah, blah, blah is, has an in at some place. Check it out. That's a lot of money floating around. So why am I alarmed about all this at all? Aside from the fact that it doesn't work. <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's iatrogenic and it actually creates the thing it claims to help with, which is reason enough in my opinion. But I think we should also be talking about, like I said at the beginning, is this the proper role of government? Is, this, is psychiatry and getting involved in mental health, the proper role of government. Somebody says here, I just, this caught my eye, John. I have to throw this up since I talked about COVID so much in the show already. If you trust the CDC after the COVID, after COVID you need your head examined. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so, you know, there's that. Um, I'm just glancing over what everyone else has said. Okay. Anyway, let me continue. Political abuse of psychiatry. I'm going to read this because I really think it, it is important. Political abuse of psychiatry, also commonly referred to as punitive psychiatry, is the misuse of a psychiatry, including diagnosis, including diagnosis, detention and treatment for the purposes of obstructing the human rights of individuals and or groups in a society. In other words, abuse of psychiatry, including that for political purposes, is the deliberate action of having citizens psychiatrically diagnosed who need neither psychiatric restraint nor psychiatric treatment. Psychiatrists have been involved in human rights abuses in states across the world when the definitions of mental disease were expanded to use political disobedience. As scholars have long argued, governmental and medical institutions code, menace, code menaces, sorry, as scholars have long argued, governmental and medical institutions code menaces to authority as mental diseases during political disturbances. Nowadays, in many countries, political prisoners are sometimes confined and abused in psychiatric hospitals. Psychiatry possesses a built-in capacity for abuse. Let's repeat that. Psychiatry possesses a built-in capacity for abuse that is greater than in other areas of medicine. Now think about transitioning children. Now think about parents losing children when they object to this. Now think about children targeted for retaliatory, punitive treatment, diagnoses, et cetera, when their parents maybe are a little too uppity at the school board meeting. Now think about parents getting diagnosed by the school as being having antisocial personality disorder, all manner of other things that could go wrong where maybe they shouldn't have their kids anymore, or maybe they shouldn't have who knows what, right? So th there's, a, there's a long and, and checkered dark history of the government inserting itself into mental health 
first defining what it is, what mental illness is and what mental health looks like. And we know already from transformative SEL that their, their claim in at Castle is that the, the person who is not willing to transform him or herself into a person focused on they, them, us, we, anybody too individualistic, anybody who refuses to think about their, their, their social awareness and their social responsibilities and their collective needs and the collective goals. It's just not socially and emotionally uh, evolved. They're, they're, they're mentally uh, less than. And even if they're not going to diagnose them straight away, the amount of browbeating that that kind of a kid, an independent-minded kid, a skeptic, an individualist, a person who says, no, I, I don't owe you a pound of my flesh. No, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to say the thing, words, the pronouns, the whatever it is. I'm not going to do it. I refuse to comply. Well, let's face it. The kids aren't saying that. They already know the score. My tutor kids, middle school kids, say, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not speaking up. Mm -mm -mm -mm. They know what will happen. They know they'll be branded as a problem. They'll be punished straight up. I have one kid that I tutor who has been kicked off a team that's very important to him because he was accused of saying something you know, like slightly offensive and from a gender perspective or whatever. On the accusation alone, kicked off the team. This is just two weeks ago. So that's punitive. And now, of course, the suggestion is that he be evaluated. He should be evaluated. Maybe something's wrong. Right? So this is important. The diagnosis of mental disease allows the state to hold persons against their will and insist upon therapy in their interest and in the broader interests of society. Psychiatry can be used to bypass standard legal procedures for establishing guilt or innocence and allow political incarceration without the ordinary odium attached to such political trials. The use of hospitals instead of jails also prevents the victims from receiving legal aid before the courts in some countries, making indefinite incarceration possible and discredits the individuals and their ideas. In that matter, whenever open trials are undesirable, they are avoided. So if we don't want to discuss and debate the merits of using somebody's preferred pronouns or of recognizing some other kind of wackadoodle thing that they're teaching in school. And we want to just say, you know, all the kids who don't go along or all the parents who don't go along with it or whatever are mentally ill. What's to stop them? What's to stop them from saying you're just not socially and emotionally evolved properly and you're going to need some more social and emotional and behavioral interventions? But if we start with the kids young enough, we won't have to, it won't get to that. We won't get to that. We'll struggle them in class. We'll struggle them, you know, right into the counselor's office if they resist the struggling in the class. The kids with their peer-led modeling, which is just softer, gentler struggling, they'll, they'll work on them too. This rewards compliance. This rewards kiss-ass behavior. This rewards passivity. And if you are anything other than those, hmm, maybe you're mentally ill, right? So, you know, we have all kinds of countries and there's, it goes through the history of all the countries of their different things. Well, let's get down to our country, shall we? Because I want you to think about the fact that, you know, today we, we have COVID in the rearview mirror. And as uh, somebody pointed out here, um, I think, who was it? Uh, was it John Hennessy pointed out that, you know, if you still trust the CDC after COVID, like what's wrong with you? And yet people have very short memories. Like they're absolutely like short attention span theater. Um, so even with that, and even with the, 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 the re science of reading debacle, we knew Lucy Calkins was full of crap for decades it was demonstrably disastrous implementing whole word reading and 3Q and all this other junk. And they kept doing it for decades, even after everybody was like, stop doing it, stop doing it, stop doing it. And now we have all this illiteracy. Okay. So same thing with different learning styles. 
That was debunked ages ago. I bet I would lay odds that every single one of you have heard a teacher, a school official, somebody talk about, well, different children have different learning styles, auditory, sensory, this, that, whatever. Total bullshit. 100% bullshit. Debunked ages ago, and yet it will not die. It just will not die. And here I just showed you, they've already begun to debunk SEL and say SEL is not working. It's iatrogenic. Hey, let's spend a billion dollars on it. I am afraid it's going to take us so much time to get rid of it. So that is why, um, oh, I was just sent something very important that I can show you to really drive the point home from our good friend, Adrian. Let me grab it. It's a clip and um, I'm going to see if I can show you this clip. The problem is I don't have my earbuds, so I'm going to have to mute myself out. Okay, so what this is, let me change um, for this tab. So there is Adrian, Saya Sophia, and she is interviewing Anna Krylov. And um, this says, viewpoint diversity and dissent being called a mental deficiency. See, it's already happening. It's already happening. All right, so I'm going to mute myself out so I can play this because I don't want to have it. Hope, well, we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> we will see what happens. Let me know if you make sure you can hear this, okay? The vein of Europe, I know Kieran, who's in the chat, he's talked about this publicly, so if you'll mind me mentioning that he was actually, he went back to university during the pandemic because he's a photojournalist, mm -hmm. so he couldn't go out mm -hmm. and do that. But um, went back to finish his degree um, at the university and wanted on he was writing on his topic um, having to do with Black Lives Matter and he was saying uh, something very <laughs> controversial about that organization and he was subsequently actually the victim of a university attempted mobbing in the UK mm -hmm. um, and it, it all worked out well because he managed to win that argument and graduate mm -hmm. with honors um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> despite the attempt of his fellow students to actually get, um, as I recall, and Kieran can correct me if I'm wrong, the petition was that, um, that, uh, the university shouldn't award a degree to this journalist who's professing these ex race. I think they called them racist ideas or something like that. Okay. <laughs> so there is, there it's, is very easy, yeah, it's very easy to be called racist. You know, some people call the Almerit paper racist apology. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so you say that people should be judged by their merit. So we shouldn't use people immutable characteristics for, you know, making appointments and award. And they say it's racist apology. <laughs> yeah, we can mm -hmm. save things here. Actually, yeah, Kieran was mentioning this was what got said about him. He was. <laughs> So as you can hear, she's saying that already, if it's just, you know, I criticize something you say um, politically, you know, I, what you're saying politically, and I'm just going to call you something. I'm going to say you're a racist apologist, you're this, you're that. And so ap apparently what Anna says, you can hear her accent that she has experienced from the Soviet Union. Um, and I was going to show some links, in fact, about that. I'll just put what I'm going to do, because I think you guys should watch this. This is a nine minute clip. So I'm going to drop it into the uh the chat and pin it so uh, you know you guys can save it and go watch that because anna i'm uh pretty sure has a lot of great info on this from based on her experience uh in the soviet union um but i did pull before this show i purposely pulled um some stuff about the soviet union because i wanted to point that out, that exact thing. And I thought to myself, you know, without even seeing that clip, that this has happened before. Why wouldn't it happen now? And in fact, it kind of is happening. We know we had the Merrick Garland thing with, you know, writing the letters about domestic terrorists and the parents are criticizing things. So that's not necessarily a mental health issue, but we're going to kind of lump you in with really bad people because you dissent. Well, what happens when the government assumes the role of arbiter of who is and is not mentally well using the school, using all the loopholes possible through the school of in loco parentis, the amount of money that they have at their disposal. We spend a trillion dollars pretty much on education a year in this country. That's a lot of money. 
there I just showed you a billion dollars going just for mental health across five years. And that's in addition to state funding, local funding, and other funding, ESSER funding, other funding that, that can be used for the same purpose. That is an enormous amount of money for one very, very narrow purpose. Um, so yeah, and so what, what Adrian was saying is that what happened to Kieran was that he was labeled mentally deficient because he was disagreeing with something at his university and they didn't want to give him a degree and you know, you're mentally deficient. And it's in the UK. So you might say, well, that's the UK. Well, hello. So here the Soviets, they, you know, they used it. Anybody who was a naysayer, activist, et cetera, they were diagnosed with being mentally unstable, politically defined madness. All right. That was just one example. Then we have China's weaponizing psychiatry against dissenters. This is in 2012, 2022. They're still doing it. In 2012, they passed a new criminal procedure code and mandated a judicial review before someone accused of a crime could be involuntarily committed. And then they put into effect a new mental health law that barred involuntary commitment except in cases involving danger to others. That So we thought everything was okay, but then a dis disturbing report charged that its reform failed and psychiatric hospitals are still being used for political repression. Does anyone doubt that for a second? Think about the January 6 people who've been imprisoned and, and how they've been treated and how many of them ended up killing themselves. I think it's been two already, right? Two suicides or something, at least. Um, we know that people's health has fallen off. What the hell are they doing to them in those prisons? I can only imagine. I can only imagine the struggle sessions that are going on in there. They're probably even experimenting on them, if I had to guess. Um... Then we have, you know, China uses mental hospitals to silence dissent. And I keep bringing up the China stuff more so than the Soviet Union and Russia, although I'm still bringing stuff like that up, because we are on track to mimic China more than the Soviet Union, more than Russia. And I say that because of AI technology, data mining, um, you know, biometrics, all the things that we've been doing, public-private partnerships is just a, just a kind of fascism. Um, even getting down to school choice, so-called, which is just an expansion of government into the private sector. And I'm going to show you something related to that that I think will, you know, make your blood run cold. Um, so they're still they're they're doing that to this day. What makes us feel so safe about it? We know that kids are being diagnosed and given medication to put, you know, put on drugs socially transitioned and in some cases referred for medical treatment before parents ever even know about it. And like I said, the history doesn't bode well. That's ironic, isn't it? The same people who tell us we have to be anti-racist, we have to do to SEL for social justice and to confront our racist past. Well, guess what was a big deal in our racist past? Using psychiatry to abuse people and keep them in, in their proper place. From diagnosing runaway slaves with an illness, they are actually coined a term for an illness that they as ascribe to runaway slaves. Well, you see, it's because they're mentally ill that they want to run away. Sound familiar? Children, especially teenagers, act out when something isn't right. And it may well be that they're depressed. It may well be that they're anxious. But the one thing that's missing from all of these programs and from the entire CDC guide, go read it, you'll see, is nothing in there suggests even the possibility that the school itself is causing the problem. That the school itself is creating the anxiety. Yes, it was uh, this um, drapedomania. That's it. That's the disorder they said runaway slaves had. Okay. Um, so yeah, but this is, this, this goes back from, from reconstruction to today. <laughs> like Dr. Benjamin Rush, the 18th century doctor, who's often called the father of American psychiatry, held the racist belief that black skin was the result of a mild form of leprosy. 
His one-time apprentice, Dr. Samuel Cartwright, spread the falsehood throughout the antebellum South that enslaved people who experienced an unyielding desire to be free were in the grip of a mental illness he called dreptomania or the disease causing Negroes to run away. What are they going to call the disease causing people to cling to their civil rights? The disease causing people to insist that they are individuals and not members of groups. The disease that causes people to deny white supremacy. I guarantee you that before long, that will be a disease, a diagnosable disease. Um, so Tony Baloney says the reason we learn here in New York City, we can be put into camps for no good reason. The governor can just give an order to take you away indefinitely. And, you know, that I'm assuming that's a COVID related thing left over. Um, and there's a see the whole truth says, you know, we have empty brand new prisons outside New York City waiting for repurposing. Yeah. Government doesn't build things or start programs without the intention of using them. They're going to be diagnoses. They'll be, di if we keep insisting that elections are rigged, for example, like let's say the one in 2024 turns out to be completely ridiculous and people don't believe it. That's going to be diagnosable. Be careful what you say and around whom, but your kid could go to school and your kid could say, my mommy said that the election was stolen. And, um, yeah, my parents are really not happy. Oh, very interesting. Thank you for telling us, Johnny. I mean, this is what we could be getting to. Now the American Psychiatric Association, which features Russia's image on his logo, is confronting the painful history. So they're, they're saying, oh, we have to confront our racist past. How about you can confront your history of wrongness? The history of being wrong. How about you confront the fact that psychology, to a large degree, is still an emerging art form? I hesitate to call it science, except in very, very narrow ways, and that it is by no means foolproof. It is not something you can rely on and go, oh yeah, they definitely know what they're doing. It's not like broken bones. Can't see it on a uh, on an x-ray. So this is Amnesty International, Russia's abhorrent, abhorrent use of punitive psychiatry to silence dissent to this day. To this day, they do it. Uh, here's another article about political abuse of, you know, dissenting voices right here in the United States, right here in the United States, systemic in the night in the Soviet Union, they did it in the seventies and eighties, but we had a, have a scattered, a history scattered with examples of the application of it during the civil rights era, African-American pastor and activist Clinton W. King Jr. tried in vain to enroll in the all white university of Mississippi, Mississippi for a summer graduate course in 1958, the Mississippi police arrested and confined him to a mental hospital because he tried to exercise his rights for 12 days on the grounds that any who tried to enter Ole Miss must be crazy. What else must be crazy that's going to be coming? Here we have this woman uh, who was Elizabeth Packard, who was declared insane for speaking up. She was silenced because she tried to speak up for herself. She was just independent. That, that was it. According to 19th century psychiatry, female independence was madness. I am genuinely, I'm not being flippant here. I am genuinely concerned that using the transformative SEL or SEBL criteria from Castle will very shortly make recalcitrant in independence and individualism a diagnosable condition. You heard it here first. When that comes to pass, that it has a history. I do believe they are working their way towards that. That, you know, well, you know, if you cannot see the social contract, if you cannot see that you are part of a collective, if you do not see the intersections of power and privilege in our society and how everything is systemically racist and woke and, the, you know, the, the, not woke, um, and, uh, uh, and, and working for the people who have power and privilege against the people who are oppressed. If you can't see that, despite all the times we tried to show you, we showed you, we taught you, we struggled you, we berated you, we isolated you, we canceled you, we fired you, and you still insist that two plus two equals four? Well, you must be crazy. And 
I know there's probably still people out there listening going, no, Deb, you are crazy to even say this. Stuff. This is nuts. You're cuckoo. <laughs> really? Am I though? I hope I am. But go back to, I don't know, a week ago before you learned there was such a thing as menu anxiety. I got to find that. I'm going to show it to you because it's real. And then you probably would say like, I've seen it all. Now that won't happen. We can't possibly go that far. Can't we though? All right. What else? Now we have Descent into Madness. This article was actually really interesting. Talks about um, how, uh, you know, the, the weaponization of psychology. This is interesting. It says Washington state bill will send political enemies to psych wards. Blair's a recent headline from Kurt Nemo's Substack. The bill in question, Washington state legislature house bill 1333 establishing the domestic violent extremism commission would, according to its critics, criminalize thought and expression under an invented category of offenses called domestic violent extremism and allow the state's attorney general to prosecute some people for words and speech rather than violent acts. Although there is nothing in the bill itself declaring that political enemies of the state will be sent to psych wards, the idea that psychologists and psychiatrists might be employed on such a domestic violent extremist commission to diagnose political dissonance with some form of mental disorder is not a misplaced one. In fact, as it turns out, there's a long and worrying history of psychiatry being used as a weapon to silence those declared to be enemies of the state. I promise you, there will be psychiatric professionals on that commission to decide that, yes, this person has violent tendencies and is a violent, is a violent extremist. And it goes through the, the, uh, um, the history and the Soviet history and so forth. And this is Alexander Solzhenitsyn. This is the incarceration of free thinking, healthy people in madhouses is spiritual murder. It is a variation of the gas chamber, even more cruel. The torture of the people being killed is more malicious and more prolonged. Like the gas chambers, these crimes will never be forgotten and those involved in them will be condemned for all time during their life and after their death. If only they, that were true, it's already being forgotten. It's already being forgotten. That's a hideous picture, so that's why I'm not showing it. Um, I submit to you that schools, are these prisons and that students wander, you know, into them, you know, go in, we send them off to these schools and they are now being, you know, in classroom, in classroom curriculum on SEL, SCBDL, et cetera, in the class stuff about, uh, you know, mental health and anxiety. How is that not equivalent to a prison? They can't leave. So they can't just leave. They leave at the end of the day, but they can't leave in the middle. They can't leave the class. They have to sit there. They walk in well. It's a rare six-year-old who shows up at kindergarten with clinical depression and anxiety disorder, right? Fair to say? Okay. So they show up well, and over the course of the next 13 years, somehow an enormous percentage of them, if we take today's statistics, are turning up with all these disorders. And nobody anywhere in the CDC document is saying, maybe it's us. Maybe we're doing it. No, of course not. We're going to double, triple, quadruple down on all the things we are doing. Despite all evidence that it's bad. In World War I, there was suppression of dissent using psychiatry. And now is what I'm going to show you that it, I saw the other night and I got a chill. Here it is. We think it's bad with public schools. They're coming for the public school kids through the CDC. Uh-oh. Now, I grant you the nation is a socialist rag, but homeschooled students, invisible mental health crisis. What do you think is in the offing? So they're running it up the flagpole first with publications like The Nation. They're not the only ones, by the way, to be talking about this. This is just the most in your face, right? Homeschooling has become America's fastest growing form of education, maybe because of all the crazy shit you're doing in the public schools. But many parents aren't equipped to handle their children's mental health struggles alone. Right. Okay. As the fourth anniversary of COVID-19 pandemic, its legacy continues to have a profound effect. No, the legacy of the shit that went down as a consequence of COVID, not COVID itself. The policies the craziness in schools, everything else going on that may have prompted people to say, I'm getting the hell out. But the presumption that parents who pulled their kids from school because they were having 
mental health problems while in the school, st- have kids who still have those problems at home is a big leap. In fact, most of the ones who were pulled for these reasons, anxiety, et cetera, have reported their kids are better. Their kids are better, like without any interventions, without doctors, without without medication, without anything. They came home, not locked up and doing virtual school, but they went home to do proper homeschooling. Maybe joined a co-op, maybe got involved in something. And most of them magically got better from their generalized anxiety disorder. You know, when their parents could take the phone away at will or do things that got them outside touching grass instead of sitting in a classroom on an electronic device all day long, they got better, right? And they keep talking about Center for Disease Control indicates a rise in poor mental health among youth. They don't differentiate. But because the, the... because at home, they don't have even these inadequate school-based resources. So the parents surely are inadequate because they don't have the school-based resources. If only there were a way to access treatment outside of a school. If only there were a way to avail myself of some help for my child without the help of big daddy government, everything would be okay. So you see what's happening. They're starting to float this idea that parents who homeschool are abusive, children who are being homeschooled being prevented and kept from mental health care. Pretty soon it's going to be a sign of mental illness that you insist on homeschooling. I mean, they have, they have all kinds of opportunities depending on the state, what they want to do, you know, it'll, it'll remain to be seen, but they, there is a concerted effort to demonize homeschool. There is no question in my mind about it. Um, And it's going to be tied to this supposed mental health crisis. So that's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. And I I hope you're not too disappointed that I'm not going through, you know, page by page of the CDC guide. Uh, I'm going to drop it. Like I said, I will absolutely put it into all the link to it uh, into the, um, the description box when we're done here, along with all my other links, but there it is. You can go through it chapter and verse if you like. But the gist of it is more of the same with more money and at every level of school, with the staff, with the family, with everything. And they show no sign of backing off. The federal government, state government, schools, the American Psychological Association, the unions are going into this election season heavy on this, I think. Because if we try to push back on it around election time, you know, if, if it comes to that or we have any candidates who are saying, this is nuts, don't do this, what an easy thing. You, so you want kids to commit suicide? We already hear about it with the gender dysphoria. You want all these kids to be mentally ill? So I'm bringing it up now. So you guys, if there are candidates, you know, local, state, federal, whatever, and you have their ear or you want to start writing letters, Start educating people, start educating voters, start educating candidates, start educating, you know, write op-eds, do whatever you have to do. Explain how it's not working from an apolitical perspective. This isn't political. This is about what works and what doesn't work. The Democrats, I guarantee you, the people in power right now and plenty of Republicans are going to politicize this. They're going to politicize this and anybody criticizing this is going to be deemed, you know, unfit to hear from. And the vast majority of people who don't know anything about it are going to hear that. Why would you want to end up with a mental health? And isn't it true that every time there's a school shooting, what's the first thing that people say who are not the gun grabbers? Well, I think you should tackle the mental health problem in the schools and then we won't have people shooting up the schools. I can't tell you how many 2A people I've heard say that, and I want to smack them. Yes, the individual who shot at the school clearly had a mental health problem. That is not why they successfully carried out a shooting. Any more than the fact that the gun existed. There are mentally unwell people all over the place who don't shoot up public places and murder people. That may have been a cause of that, but the real cause, and if you want to read 
you know, a book that explains how it's all inter interconnected with the school and its policies, you can read Why Meadow Died. And it's got very little to do with the fact that that boy was disturbed and everything to do with the fact that the politicians and the school officials and everybody whose job it was to protect the students at that school and enforce the rules they had and enforce the law of that state, of that city, of that county, et cetera, around that the boy's behavior long before the shooting, irrespective of whatever was causing his behavior, his mental illness, um, they failed. They failed utterly to do what they were supposed to do. And all the SCL in the world wouldn't have stopped it. All the, uh, you know, you could have done more anti-bullying. You could have done all kinds of therapy for him. You know, da, 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 whatever. If the rules were still enforced as they weren't, he probably still would have done what he did. If they still said to the police, don't arrest him because then he'll have to be kicked out of school and we'll have it on our record and we won't get money. He probably still, you know, it's still what happened. That's what caused that shooting, not the mental illness. And those of you out there, and I, I, I conservative or otherwise, I don't care. If your first go-to is mental illness is causing all the shootings, you are engaging in left-wing root cause fallacy. No, it's not mental illness. Yes, a shooter may be mentally ill, but it's not mental illness that's causing it. And it's just like it's not guns that's causing it. We're not enforcing the laws we have. We are not doing a good job of securing soft targets in target-rich environments. We're putting every other thing under the sun ahead of security where people are vulnerable. And that's where that comes from. So don't fall prey to that. And I promise you, when we get closer to election, they're going to be going, whoa, so you want schools to get shot up? Okay, restorative justice person. Really? I mean, that's what you have to be prepared to say that you have to be prepared to call them on their root cause fallacies, to call, to call them out on their own malfeasance. No one's doing it. And the proof is in this booklet and the billion dollars that are going to go out to the schools. The people most to blame for any kind of mental health problem that we might have on mass are the schools. It's so obvious. It's like if it were a snake, it would bite you. <sighs> anyway, so uh, that's basically today's show. <laughs> Thank you guys for uh, for being here and for listening. Um, can I post them in the chat? What do you want me to post? I posted the um, I posted the CDC thing. I'm going to put all the links, like all the links I showed you, literally all of them. I'll drop them after the show in the description box. So you can go through the resources at your leisure. Um, like I said, I, you know, I just feel like I, I read you a bunch today and I definitely want you to watch Adrian's full clip because that is great evidence. Thank you for sharing that, that it has happened before that, you know, your political views can be very, very easily, uh, turned into a mental illness. Uh, I think they already are. I genuinely believe it's already happening. When you go read Castle's website and read the, the descriptions for what transformative SEL is designed to do, and you you see the categories, like you see what they say they want to achieve, everything they aim to achieve is the inverse of what America has always stood for. It's the it's it's not individualism. It is not individual rights. It is not personal responsibility. It's all the things opposite of that. They might as well say, we want to replace the United States with the Soviet Union <laughs> or rights with a bill of duties. That would be more honest. And that's what they're going to spend all this money teaching your kids. And they're calling it mental health. Let's not go by the government's definition of mental health. How about it? All right, you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Um, please consider joining me at woke screen. Um, so that's wokescreen.com forward slash the reason we learn join today and you'll get, you can free upgrade from the base logician membership up to rhetorician and get all the benefits, like literally all the benefits. So I hope I see you there. Have a good one.